Yeah, I have a question for David. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm Roger Pelkey at the University of Colorado. And uh, my question is, is, what do we do about ignorance? What do we do when, when uh, as John Maynard Keynes said, that we're ignorant about what the price of copper is going to be 200 years from now, and there's no basis for probabilities? Um, the scale the IPCC used is taken from a paper that includes ignorance as one of its categories, and it took the uncertainty categories but ignored the ignorance category. Can I collect, I'll collect uh, four, four or so and come back to the panel, if that's okay? <coughs> Eric. Uh, Eric Milstone from, um, from STEPS. The question I want to ask is a question posed to David, and it resembles the question I asked Mike Hume yesterday, which is, I mean, I, the, the, um, the breast cancer story is a very interesting one. The graphics are very interesting. But it's something of an oversimplified case by comparison with many of the others we've been discussing the last couple of days, because there the risks and the benefits accrue to the same group of individuals, whereas most of the other stories we've been discussing are ones where those who bear the risk often don't get the benefit. So how would you deal with those cases? Thank you. Gentleman at the back here, and then yeah. Brian Wynn. Uh, Roger Williamson, IDS. Um, Professor uh, Spiegelhatter, um, your... Um, what do you do about advertising? I mean, I'm very interested, for example, uh, Cancer Research UK have a strap line which is something like, together we can beat cancer, which to me sounds like wishful thinking rather than evidence-based policy. So what do you do if the public don't actually want understanding, uh, they want reassurance? Thanks. Um, Brian Wynn from Lancaster. Thanks very much to all four speakers. Some really great uh, presentations. And j there's so much that one could pick up on. So I'm just going to actually make an observation and invite a response from David with respect to the breast cancer example, which he gave the breast screening, breast cancer screening case. I think it's very interesting. It's really good and really enlightened as you described it. Um, the, the approach of giving the patient all of those kinds of ins and outs and uncertainties and then offering them informed choice rather than saying do it or don't do it. Um, isn't it interesting though that with respect to individual patients in this case, individual citizens, we actually say you make the choice, it's your responsibility. We don't do that with ministers when we're actually giving them scientific advice as Andy has pointed out in his Nature article a year or more ago, keep it complex, we actually let them hide behind the science and pretend that actually there's a scientific answer to a policy question. I just wondered whether you might like to reflect, or any of the panel, reflect upon that interesting distinction. Uh, I find it you know, worth some reflection myself. The classic response is for uh, a patient to say, um, thank you very much, I really appreciate you having, giving me that information, what do you think I should do? Which seems to be a very fair, I do it to doctors, you know, thank you very much, what do you think I should do? Now that is the standard response among many people, and, and I really respect that, that's absolutely fine. Now, um, <laughs> whether that's the response a minister should have on being given all sorts of you know, different multiple viewpoints, I'm not sure at all on that. Um, I, just on these other points, just very quickly, uh, this business of you know, people want reassurance and everything like that. Um, well, you, you know, people are people, and we know that you know, the, 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 their attitudes to risks and uncertainties are, you know, are governed by um, you know, cultural and psychological, you know, their emotional, their, their heuristic feeling, the way they respond to things. Um, the, I, I should just point out there's this wonderful innovation about evaluating good risk communication. And it, it's fantastic, which says that the major output should not be whether people like it or even understand or can remember it. It should whether they become immune to irrelevant anecdotes, misleading anecdotes. You're trying to breed immunity to misleading anecdotes. 
so that if you give someone good risk communication, it should mean the next time they hear about someone who smoked 40 a day and lived till 105, or their auntie Nelly, you know, had cranberry juice and her cancer went away and all this sort of stuff, they, they think, yeah, but I've seen these numbers, whatever, and they're less influenced. And there's been randomized trials done showing that if you use icon arrays rather than other ways of presenting information, it sticks in the mind so much that people become less immune, more immune to misleading anecdotes. These are standard trials being done. So I think it's a very powerful, you know, you can't change, you know, people, we're all human, we all respond, we all like reassurance, we all think. But they, that seems to be a very pragmatic way of, of, of expressing and, and measuring what we're trying to, to do. The, um, on the asymmetry of risk business, the fact that, as I said, yeah, in these things, it is obviously a really nice, easy study because we can, you know, the, there's not an asymmetry of risk. The, you, the person is taking both the harm, the, the, the hit, and the potential benefit. When there's asymmetries, it's a very difficult issue because why should I take take a harm uh, when someone else is getting getting the benefit? Um, and frankly, I'm not quite sure how to best do that. Except I still believe that you should have uniform reporting of harms and benefits. It's just that it's not going to be at the individual level. It's going to be at a societal level much more, and people are going to have to buy into societal. Um, their contribution to society much in the same way as people buy into vaccination as, much, as a societal contribution as much as an individual contribution. So I, I don't think the principles of uniform reporting go away. It just has to be done possibly at a slightly higher level. I, I'd, I had a couple of comments. I mean, one is a little bit similar to Roger's question to David, but um, in in the scale where, David, you showed us the gradations, you know, here we're really quite unlikely to change our minds. Here we're, um, you know, further research might make us change our minds. But there's another category which I think is more relevant to some of the very complex sort of vexed issues that we deal with, which, I mean, I wouldn't say breast cancer was a simple issue, but it's, uh, as others have pointed out, you know, it's a, it's a little bit more easy to locate. And in, in the so-called unstructured problems that we keep dealing with now, there's another category which would be no amount of scientific evidence on this issue will ever change our minds <laughs> at all. <laughs> on both sides or on multiple <laughs> sides and although that sounds ridiculous in a way it's also an indication that the pr pr that the, f the main questions on which people diverge are not scientific i mean people mentioned weinberg and so on yesterday so um and i think it's interesting that the recent um royal society and royal society of engineering report on fracking which was a very specific analysis of the likelihood of seismicity and well failure. Um, okay, fine, but it didn't, it, it didn't make all the anti-fracking people say, oh, okay then, that's fine, we'll go away now. And that's because there's a whole series of issues that it quite explicitly didn't ad address. So I, I think that's, that's uh, important. And then on Brian's question, I, I'm not going to answer it, but um, I do make an observation that there's been a lot of discussion about the need for scientists to be more honest and explicit about uncertainties or incertitudes, David, David's point about proclaiming uncertainty. But I think there's a, there's a, a symmetrical requirement on the part of political actors and policy makers to proclaim their own limited degrees of freedom. So they might as well say up front, tell me what the science says, but I'm not going to listen to you anyway because if I do, I'll be voted out of office. And that's fair enough. We live in a democracy, not a technocracy. But let's have this sort of honesty on both sides about uncertainties and degrees of freedom in political action, which would, I think, make for a rather healthier debate. Hi, Jimmy Whitworth from the, the Wellcome Trust. I'm a clinician, and I'm very interested in what you're presenting there, David, because my experience has been that people um, respond to the risk information differently depending on what their experience actually happens to be. Now, you've presented there something that is depersonalized, objective, and yes, I can absolutely see how people can 
engage with that and decide how they like to see it presented. But if you're actually in there and you have breast cancer or you might have breast cancer, then for you as an individual, it's 100% one way or the other. I mean, either it's 100% of a tragedy and you die of it, or it's 100% of a triumph and you have got through it, or 100% of relief that you've been screened and there was nothing there. And I think that individuals simply respond very differently depending on what their experiences are in this way. Hi, uh, Rob Doubleday from the University of Cambridge. It's a question for Suman. Um, I think, for, and I'll begin by saying I think this, this meeting's been fantastic. The conference has been really, you know, a wonderful bringing together of different kinds of questions and addressed in, in pragmatic and thoughtful ways by, mem by many different speakers. Um, but one sense I have is that part of the conditions that has made this possible in the UK is, is a, a, a kind of questioning and a sense of um, o on the way that scientific advisory systems work in the UK, you know, and whether it might be as, as David outlined in the sense of, you know, how do we communicate the uncertainty? There are all other kinds of pressures. But if you, if you look, I mean, I'm curious in terms of how you see this in India. Is there any, how would you characterize the kinds of pressures that are put on a scientific advisory system in India? Is there any analogy with the kinds of um, <coughs> pressures we're seeing here. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, my question's for Dr. Muller, actually. Um, one of the things that I do is I work as an expert for the agency in Europe that deals with culture and media. Um, <coughs> this year has seen a real surge in applications from that sector with science or science engagement as part of them. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a way of working across to the other agencies. So you painted a picture of sort of how it goes up and down, but I'm interested in how we can actually start to move across the various agencies when it comes to science and science engagement. Uh, uh, this, is a qu uh, this is Deepak Gewali from Nepal, and uh, this question either to Susan or Jan, but then I think David or Suman can take a stab at it. Uh, you know, the session is on power and plurality, and uh, there's a you know, of the six ancient systems of Hindu philosophy, there's one called Samkhya that talks about power. And of the three types of power, Sattvic, Rajasik, Tamasik, basically it means coercive power or persuasive power or ethical power. And these three kind of match, you know, the procedural bureaucratic power or the persuasive seductive power of the market or the ethical power of this ethics community. Okay, my question is, in the European Parliament or, you know, whatever you have here, uh, where do your politicians come from of the three? Uh, have they come as retired generals and bureaucrats? Have they come, uh, you know, from the private sector, you know, somehow weaseled in? In India, it's a big problem because in the time of independence, uh, I think most of the politicians came from this ethics group, uh, trade unions and teachers and all. Now they come from the absolute free market uh, area, the Indian parliamentarians, especially at the state level where they are coming from jail, you know, where they are 30 percent are elected from jail, okay, for extreme free market practice like smuggling and, uh, you know, and things like that. Uh, or are they coming from these trade unions and, you know, these ethic communities? Now, that determines the nature of how we look at either the European Parliament or the British Parliament or the Indian Parliament for that matter. <coughs> I'll just do the one that was asked me about. Yeah, we, we know that people respond very differently, particularly on the basis of their own experience of themselves, their relations, and what people around them are saying, the, the social norms. So many people will be so fearful of cancer, they'll do absolutely anything to try to avoid the thought of it. Other people are, will be very fearful of over-treatment and, uh, and will welcome the opportunity to have a rational, you know, actually quite a rational basis for saying, no, I'm not going to go for screening because they, 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 they really don't want to do something unless it's strictly necessary. However, first of all, I'd say there's still an ethical duty to provide transparent information for both those groups anyway. And thirdly, there is a middle group who actually, you know, will be, you know, um, you know, will not be completely decided one way or another on the basis of their feelings or their experience. And so, um, and all the more reason for those people to have transparent information. Even if their choice is then to say, what do you think I should do, and pass it back, 
absolutely reasonable response, but I think it's both a, a duty, uh, well, I just think it is a duty to provide transparent information for all those groups. On the question of the relevance of scientific advice in a country like India or in India, it has to be seen in the context of what technology means to the economy to a very large scale. In Europe and in the United States, you have economies that are very, very dependent on science and technology. So scientific advice, scientific bodies have a, a primacy that they don't yet have in, in, uh, in India. Having said that, there are still scientific bodies. And what is happening in India is in the decision-making process, uh, the decision-making process is opening up. So you may not have structured bodies as advisors, etc., although there is, there is such a body also. But what is far more evident uh, is the process of consultation with experts and scientists on all kinds of decisions. And this has happened also in the case of GMOs, which has been India's very, very controversial, where the government is distinctly on another side as civil society, and where civil society so far is prevailing. And I don't wish to declare that as a triumph, but it speaks for the attempt at going into decision making in a democratic kind of way, acknowledging and accepting and inviting expertise and scientific expertise from many, many quarters. Well, the question about the agencies, I mean, any large organization has a tendency of working in silos. We know that. There's with national governments, the same with the European Commission or any other. And what, of course, uh, Anglava tries to do, as she has the kind of helicopter view, is to bring the people together from the different silos, breaking the silos, and make them meet. And then what we often then notice in meetings that mm, people from the one DG say, oh, we didn't notice that the other DGs were working on the same topic. And, and the same is, of course, the, the, the case with the, with the agencies. And what, for example, the science-driven agencies are creating at the moment is a network of the chief scientists of these agencies. Well, it wasn't existing so far, but many of these agencies face the same problems, particularly in the, in the area of risk communication, um, so that they create now networks between the agencies to share the views, to share best practices, and, and this way also kind of uh, come to better solutions also for the citizens. So that's definitely something which is very high on the agenda. On your question concerning powers, um, as I said, Europe is very complex, and uh, if you look at the European Parliament, you see very much the different kind of national cultures because each country has its type of political systems, its type of party system, and with this also its type of politicians that you find from these countries in the parliament. And it's very interesting to see when you see voting behaviors in the European Parliament that voting behavior is often not, not along party lines, it's along national lines still. Uh, and in this way, uh, it's, it's difficult to answer the question from which type of, of power um, um, people come from. It really depends from the res respective national context. And, and that's something, something which I would say is the reality of Europe we have to deal with. Thanks. I'll just take the, take the question about power. I mean, I think you ask actually a very com complex question. And I have three comments. They're not really answers, but just comments. I mean, one is that it doesn't seem to me that the most important elements of power are, are necessarily exercised by politicians in this country or, or any other. They do have a kind of power, but it's quite severely circumscribed, especially in a globalizing world. Um, I think actually social movements have had a significant amount of power, especially when you look in the long term, if you take the long view. So looking back to the 1960s where I began my analysis of the work of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, the changes that have happened over that half century in respect to environmental politics have been enormous. And they have, part, they have very largely in fact, been due to the environmental movement science has a role as well, but that's been important in the longer term in changing the frame. And the final comment, I suppose, is that all theorists of power tend to recognize different kinds of power, as do philosophers of power. And uh, I've always rather liked um, Schatzschneider's uh, axiom that the definition of the alternatives is the supreme instrument of power.
much. Well, uh, that was, uh, thank you very much for the panel. It was a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful panel, great question. I want to make one final point very quickly myself, which follows exactly from Susan's point in our experience this afternoon. That in, as far as my understanding of these issues is, that we can put so much effort, and it's hugely worthwhile, into methods, into procedures, into institutions, to try and affect the kind of opening up we're talking about here in different ways. But in the end, what makes a space for that is the wider political climate. And no, nothing is as effective at opening up these debates as forced humility, which is brought to attention by social movements. And the fact that we've conducted this discussion at the grace and discretion of a social movement <laughs> who, through, uh, through a, a process of, of negotiation, has allowed this space to, to stay, notwithstanding the other events underway, I think affects the message really, really clearly. So thank you very much to all concerned.